Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Yasmine Flores, and welcome to another episode of the Arts at EPCC. With me today is one of my favorite people. Do I have favorites? Yes, I do. Do I have favorite students? I'm not going to lie to you. Yes, I do. And But more importantly, this gentleman is wonderfully talented. And he is with us today, Mr. Frank Rimbach. Hello, Frank. Hello, how are you, Yasmin? I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> I am glad that you're here. I'm very excited. So you are the Assistant Professor of Art at Rio Grande, correct? I, I am. Yes. And you also teach a couple of classes at Via Verde. I do. There's oh, a wonderful. bit of a sharing in terms of some classes, uh, mm -hmm. so I kind of do both campuses. Awesome. So now tell me, so I've had a couple of folks on the show from the art department. I've had Brack and Isadora. And and so they've told me that they teach a variety of classes. And you just mentioned a moment ago printmaking, right? So this is one of the classes you teach. No, I don't no. teach. We were, okay. That's for art appreciation. We oh, were discussing okay, the it. printmaking chapter. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah. So you teach art, art appreciation. Art appreciation. Mm -hmm. um, I teach uh, drawing one. Okay. Drawing two. Mm -hmm. Life drawing. Yes. Painting one. Okay. Painting two. And design one. What is Design One? Design One, I think, is uh, one of the most important classes you can take as an artist. It's understanding the principles of 2D on the flat surface, the two-dimensional surface, mm -hmm. and how elements go together. Okay. Uh, it's about color. Mm -hmm. It's about grayscales. It's about symmetry, asymmetry. And in some ways, it's about how we see the visual language in the world around us, how things are organized breaking those down, putting them together, and coming up with interesting imagery mm -hmm. and or shapes mm -hmm. that come together to grab an audience in and make somebody go, I want to see that movie, or I want to buy that CD, or what is that signage about? So sure. I think it's, it's, it's the beginning principle of the building block. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think design one and drawing one are the most important classes you can take as an artist. Awesome. So do you discuss the color wheel? Color wheel is discussed. Okay. Color wheel is, is, is created. Colors are discussed in terms of their heat, intensity, coolness, mm -hmm. uh, how they work, and how to mix colors. In some ways, for me, it's a very preparatory class for painting one, uh, how, to, how to bring colors alive. I always talk about working uh, color in terms of complementaries to min mineralize a color. So if you're working with red, mm -hmm. you want to bring a little bit of green into it. If you're working with violet, you want to just give a, a, just a, a, a dot of yellow to bring it alive. Mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of color formulas and theories, but when you're mixing color, uh, mm -hmm. paint color, there's a way to uh, make colors harmonize and work together. Interesting. So let me ask you this, and I'm going to ask you this from my wardrobe perspective because I play it safe, okay? I wear black pants and a colored shirt. <laughs> That's what I do. Uh -huh. uh, out of fear, because if I were to just mix and match on my own, um, <laughs> I would wind up with some very interesting things. So, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of dig into this because it's one of the things that fascinates me about art is the color wheel. And so there's opposites, right, that work well. Is that correct? Right. So you have your complementary colors and your secondary colors. So the complements red, yellow, blue, secondary, green, orange, and violet. And, okay. And the emotions that they play on the senses and how they're uh, put together uh, move us. You think about all your baseball and football teams, UTEP, what, what's UTEP's colors? Yeah, the They're orange and blue, Orange and right. blue, so you have a, a, a primary and a secondary. Oh. And I, I, I think that the lesson for me, at least when I'm teaching it, if you, the secondaries are made from the primaries, at least if you're using additive mixing colors. Sure. So if you take a red mm -hmm. and a yellow, mm -hmm. you get- Orange. You get orange. Right. So basically, the two primaries mm -hmm. form a particular power uh, emotionally mm -hmm. that activate the blue. Um, okay. And it's just not uh, emotional, it's physiological. Uh, the, the experiments, if you took a red and you had a green square in the middle of it and you mm -hmm. stared at it, your uh, eyes, the uh, rods and cones, but I think it's the, uh, get this right, it's the, uh, the, uh, the cones, I'm gonna say, mm -hmm. uh, flood and the red, 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 you remove that stimulus, mm -hmm. what floods in um, on the molecular level is the opposite, green. 
Okay. So there is a physiological dynamic to how that works and why that works. And that's why I see black spots after looking at headlights. Right, absolutely, <laughs> because it's a, it's the white, and and yeah. if, and and in terms of gray scales of the the tissue of the eye, if you look to the side mm -hmm. at night, you see movements of gray better than looking straight on, in terms of where the saturation oh. of those uh, um, color sensors are in the in the retina in the back of the eye. Interesting. Okay, now I'm gonna now I'm gonna jump over to the life drawings. The you so basically I know you teach a class at Via Verde. Uh, with live people, right? We have li live students and we have live models as well. Okay, okay. And so tell me a little bit about that. So do they have to sit still the whole time? No, but it it's helps if they can sit still and it's very difficult to do. Yeah. Uh, but there's breaks. So most people can go maybe 15, 20 minutes before they start fidgeting and moving. Some people who are, are uh, have done it for a while mm -hmm. can really get into a pose. Obviously, yeah. lying down poses or sitting poses are easier than standing. And poses with the uh, body dynamics are a little bit more difficult mm -hmm. when you give them a stick or something. Yeah. Uh, so wow. it all depends. Mm -hmm. um, and then for me, in terms of life drawing, it's always the relationship. You know, where is the shoulder related to the arm? Mm -hmm. where, where is, you know, the size of your body, seven, eight heads fit your body? How big is your head? Well, right. most heads are basically eight and a half, nine inches this way, mm -hmm. and maybe six inches ear to ear. That's everybody within an inch or a half inch. Wow. So the dynamics in terms of how the body works in terms of a structure mm -hmm. is pretty similar. And I'm, I'm wanting the students to work from observation. So they make these, uh, cre uh, they're, um, oh, what do you call this? Uh, uh, not creative, it's like uh, critical thinking analysis of reading form and understanding something to something else. I was told by a philosophy instructor who sat in on a class once that it's a type of uh, geometry that you're studying. And so it's almost visual geometry, mm. not quite a calculus, but there's, mm -hmm. a, uh, there's a symbolic uh, relationship to organizing the space of the body and the elements right. to uh, tautologies in terms okay. of philo uh, philosophy problems in some fashion. Okay, and I can see the geometry, obviously, because you're, you know, you're measuring, right, all these aspects right. visually. You're basically, I, I don't want to say ballparking, because you're not actually taking a ruler out. Uh, no, you're not, but I do take a ruler out to show okay. people because people don't believe their eyes. Right. So they, they have the conception that they are imagining or making up what they want it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I have an assignment in the drawing one class where I, I basically am making the students measure their face mm -hmm. and they don't realize or can't uh, conceptualize that their eyes are in the middle of their face. If they're right. in the dead middle of your face. If it, this yeah. is eight inches, uh -huh. it's at four. Yeah. And even when they have that down and they make the diagram, uh -huh. they still want to raise the eye up into the forehead. Yeah. So there's this, there's <laughs> a separation has to happen where you're analyzing critically mm -hmm. what you're looking at and you're trying not to emotionally put something into it in terms of a sensibility that isn't there. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, it's, and it's fascinating because I do know what you're talking about. I did. I took some art classes when I was in middle school with uh, Mr. Dosal. Um, he taught at Isu Middle School uh, 30 years ago. Hello. <laughs> Says a while back. But I do remember that. I remember that was one of the projects we had to do. We had to draw a human face. Um, there was abstract. We did abstract drawing uh, and everything. But I remember that about the face. You're absolutely right. And could it be that... Could it be that because on a two-dimensional surface, you're also having to draw this part of the head, right? Like if, if I were to squish my face in, I'm still having to draw this part of the head. Right, could, well, could we don't, right, like I'm not experiencing the top of my head. Uh -huh. And even when I'm looking in the mirror, there's a sense that it's, it's part of me, but it's not. So you have sure. to kind of have this removal of yourself to some degree mm -hmm. to get that. You know, the difficulty with life drawing is you're having to convert the 3D world flat two-dimensionally. It's very easy to copy something that's already been photographed or drawn or converted already because you're just following the outline and the contours and then sure. maybe some shading. Yeah. But to see that in actual time is adding a higher level of component of need. And that's mm -hmm. where it gets really complicated for uh, many people. That's very interesting. So let me ask you another question. Do you find that some students 
because you, you kind of touched on this. Do you find that some students will draw, basically is everyone is drawing their perspective because honestly, is anything truly accurate? Yeah, I, I do think things are accurate, and I think that's the goal one strives for. I think okay. that we draw a, an, a, a, Cezanne called it an equivalency. So when you're painting or looking at the world, it's not that thing. It's, it's something that's close to it. But when you're measuring it, I could say, if I'm, my criteria is naturalism and how it lines up to the re reality of things, then having an L for a nose doesn't work because we're not doing cartooning. Right. And just having kind of like these <laughs> eyes that are just not really observed and, and are just circles mm -hmm. are not looking. So I'm looking for the student to go deeper into observation and critical thinking yeah. as opposed to inventing. In, sure. and, and believe it or not, invention actually in some ways is harder, especially on a unique level. Mm -hmm. but, but the measurement is like looking and getting that and, and perceptions will be different. If everybody drew this book in that cup or a pencil, everybody's would be slightly different. But mm -hmm. the measurement is like, can you draw that pencil? And you know I do that assignment where I sit in a chair and everybody draws right, me. Right, yes. So, but they're all <laughs> slightly different. They yes, all they look kind of like me, mm -hmm. but they're the variation of that student's awareness of me. And some get very close mm -hmm. that you're like, well, that is Frank, but they're slightly different Franks. Yeah. And then some get very caricaturist and, uh, yeah. and cartoony. Right, right. So I, I want to push the sensibility closer to realism mm -hmm. and then go off. Because at the beginning foundation classes is what we teach, there should be a handle on that before you go off into whatever the abstraction is going to be or pushing those things. I think it's Got difficult it. to push something if you don't know the rules. Okay. Let me ask you, let's go back in time. What drew you pun intended, to the arts, to art. What drew general. me, well, the students have been drawing me recently. <laughs> um, I uh, came to the arts late, so I used to play music. And you were one of us. I was a music person. Yes. And then uh, I had a sense I, I need to go take some art classes. So I went to mm -hmm. community college in California. Mm -hmm. I took a life drawing, a watercolor, a drawing class a painting class and I realized this is my, there was something in my nature that I responded to. So working full time, taking classes at night. So, mm -hmm. and it was the idea, you know, coming from California, there's a lot of enriched museums. Sure. So you have, you know, the, the LA County, the Getty, the, um, the Modern, you have the Norton Simon, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. When you have, and you get to see the, the real stuff in person, the aspiration was, I wonder if I can do that. Mm -hmm. I felt I could do modernism a little bit. There was something uh, mechanically understandable about Picasso and Matisse to some level. But er, as you go back in time, the difficulty is there. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember as a kid, you know, we would take uh, bus trips uh, uh, in, I think it was elementary school, to the LA County, and there was an Ed Kleinholz exhibit. It looked like my mom's garage. <laughs> just and I was like, oh my <laughs> gosh, you know, very contemporary yeah. with figures and a radio and, and a. Uh, it just looked like a wood shop with objects, and I thought, oh wow, this is art too. Mm -hmm. And so there was mm -hmm. like, um, that helped that in that development early on, or at least planted those seeds. Sure. And then you gotta, you gotta take the path. Right. And it's a long path to, yeah. go, to go paint and draw, for sure. Right, it, what was your first success? My first success? Um, uh, that's a good, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I remember doing a landscape that I thought was really good mm -hmm. of uh, Pierce College. Okay. Just a, a landscape in the green and how it rolled. And I thought, wow, that really looks like the landscape. Mm -hmm. And so that, that kind of hooked me. I could copy. If I was looking at somebody's art, I was able to copy it. But to mm -hmm. sit and do a landscape on my own, I think that was like an epiphany that like, okay, I'm having some understanding here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, through my life as I'm moving through uh, places where I lived and time, I was always taking classes somewhere, mm -hmm. st you know, studying with somebody yeah. until I went back to college to study art. Right. And so uh, there was a lot of uh, working on my own to try to figure this out, and then I realized I needed more serious mentors than I was getting on my own. Sure, of course. Now, you brought a little something ah, for yes. us today, and I want to read a little bit about this book and the book begins dear children no no <laughs> it's not a children's book 
I think there's stuff that. in there that children may not be able to, uh, <laughs> okay. to have. Actually. I'm completely joking. Yes, actually, let me show this to the audience. So this book is called Painting Retrospective, 1987 to 2020. And, and this is... This is, thank you. Yes, I've got the cameraman telling me exactly where to hold this book. Thank you. So this is by Frank Rimbach, and Frank said that you can find this on Amazon.com, which is extremely exciting. Can I, can I show some Absolutely, pages? you can show pictures. Yeah. I prefer maybe the landscapes because... Those are beautiful. Uh, I think those are the beginnings Ooh. of uh, yeah. what it was about. Um, oh, that's beautiful. Um, I love the colors in this. Right, so that's early undergrad. So oh, how that, that about may be that? one of the second or third paintings in an undergrad class. Oh my goodness, um, that's awesome. So, and these are beautiful. This is gorgeous. Right. I love this. I'm going to show this picture. So, my my love was of course, you can if you look at my work French impressionism was a big influence on me. Yeah. So, I was wanting to get that feeling that a painting could have. Of yeah. course, that's in Lawrence, I believe. Okay. And so, All right. awesome. and some of them are from life, meaning the yeah. plain air painting, and some of them are developed from photographs. Sure. Um, and you know, wanting to have, you know, a painting has a different feeling than the photograph for me. A painting uh, developed kind of has this other uh, mystique or uh, evocative. It's evocative of something else if it's mm -hmm. if it's done well. So I think that there's something interesting. Uh, how the color comes across, how you set up the composition, etc. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Oh, look at this. this is so Show detailed. Those. Show yeah, those. that's a beautiful. I went through a period where I was uh, in grad school where I had a focus. And so the focus became, why am I interested in painting? Yeah. What is my painting about? And I said, if I just paint everything in my apartment as well yeah. as I can, I will learn something from that. Right. So I started with the bookshelves. I painted the kitchen. I painted the bathroom. <laughs> I painted the bedroom. I painted... <laughs> <laughs> everything I could yeah. as well as I could uh -huh. uh, and I tried to do some of the stuff life-size so mm -hmm. that some of these paintings were very very large and I learned how to mix color I learned how to see light mm -hmm. and then I realized my interest was in making unconsidered things mundane and elevating them in a particular fashion mm -hmm. and I think there's a way to do that you can make something uh, exciting if it's mundane and yeah. has, has no significance whatsoever. So you look at it again differently. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went through many years doing work like that. Right. I don't think my work's like that now. I think it's much more um, uh, dealing with memory and longing and maybe mm -hmm. uh, a type of romantic ennui of the past and mm -hmm. desire. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's made up now to some mm -hmm. extent. So I'm not looking at things as much as I'm inventing uh, scenarios for these still lives and figures and so, landscapes. So let me ask you this question, and then I, I think I'm going to show this one just one more, uh, because this is something that fascinates me about your art. Um, you have an Instagram account. I do, Frank Rimbach, Frank.Rimbach yes. at Instagram, and you could see okay. some postings. Awesome. Uh, I think the last two years I started posting. Yeah, um, and so I've looked at some of your stuff on, on Instagram. And one of the things that strikes me, because I was just looking at some of these pages earlier, and the way you draw people has changed. Yes. And and so I guess like, and even these like eight pictures that are in front of us, and you, you're talking about this. Let me ask I'm you a question. Just do this as you're talking. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, he's going to have you hold it up a certain way. No, that's okay. Oh, okay. Make, make the, the cameraman work a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> he may tell you to raise it no, and then it's okay. He just, he's needs, okay. he just needs a section. He doesn't need <laughs> <Just> much. <laughs> so, so let me say this. So when you're, if we walked outside right now, yes. right? And I were to paint the parking lot. Okay. And it's two o'clock, two thirty on a Tuesday afternoon in March. And, um, do you think that do painters, and I, this is a big question, do artists impose their feelings intentionally or do you think that it's subconsciously imposed how they're feeling? I think it's a little bit of both. I think if you can remove feeling, sensitivity and sensibility comes through no matter what. 
So there'd be a lot of beautiful gray scales that you'd be dealing with. Mm -hmm. So I'd be mixing uh, a gray with uh, uh, yellow and violet and a gray with red and green and a gray with blue and orange and I'd make grays with uh, different th blacks and intermix these colors and mute them down with white. Mm -hmm. And you'd realize that there's all these different types of grays and pink grays and uh, yellow green grays that are coming through because color in nature is very rare actually. There's just a little bit of color. Right. And so it's mostly gray that are, uh, so you'd set up this structure and it could be done very sensitively and well. Uh, and and I, you know, if you wanted to make it a fauve painting in bright colors, well that would change the feeling of it. Mm -hmm. But if you were honestly just trying to get those uh, colors correct mm -hmm. uh, and the drawing right, I think what would hold it together would probably be the linear perspective in the parking lot, and mm -hmm. then you could hang all these grays uh, on the shapes and the colors, and it would say something. Uh, now, I, I want to do that as an assignment, maybe when COVID li uh, uh, li uh, light lightens up, right. uh, to see what would happen if you had a group of uh, artists just working in. And it would have to be oil, I think, because acrylic uh, dries too fast to get those oh, mixtures, I see. Uh, in, my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of artists when they're working with color, they have a small set of colors and they go, oh, it's green, so that's the green I have. You should have 10 greens mixed. Yeah. You should have five uh, reds mixed, and then you're like, well, it's a variation of this. Mm -hmm. So oil does that much better than acrylic does. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. But yeah, you can make something of it, and if you do imbue it with your emotion, then I want, I want the student to ask themselves, or me, why am I doing that? Yeah. Like, what am I wanting to say uh, with that? Mm -hmm. um, and then those are the critical discussions that, that get discussed in the critique. Well, right. what did this mean for you? And, and what are you feeling? Or what is this idea about? Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you do it well enough, uh -huh. it doesn't need an idea. The sure. idea comes later. You know? Oh, got it. OK. Well, if it attracts your eye mm -hmm. and you have some feeling, and I mean, it moves you in some way, mm -hmm. your, your intellect can always find a reason for it. Sure, sure. So. Uh, let me ask you, like, for example, when people paint things and they make, I guess if they're trying to make it look nostalgic or, or if they're trying to evoke a memory of long ago, right? Uh, if you look at a painting of, like, the 1950s, like a 1950s gas station, mm -hmm. for example, how, if you take a photograph of it, you know, in that time, if they took a photograph and you're looking at the photograph, and I, is it... I guess if I were to paint that photograph, how could I evoke more more nostalgia? How could I? Well, that's I don't know. I, when you think of gas stations in the fifties, I think Edward Hopper, uh, more contemporary, may, maybe Ed Ruscha, uh, with his standard uh, um, li uh, lines and, and kind of uh, they're kind of more like uh, language font and, and uh, design aspects of a gas station. The mm -hmm. question would, I would have is like, so you're appealing to this nostalgia that w it was better and maybe there's an old car there or some right. kind of cool Chevrolet. Sure. And so then you're speaking of something of the past and the question is, it will appeal to some people that like, I had that Packard mm -hmm. and, I w and that reminds me of my grandfather. And the question is like, so that's the energy you're trading in. And so I don't know if, wh if you're asking me how to imbue something of the past, I guess you'd have to look up some old photographs. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm saying that I'm imbuing something with nostalgia, it's more of my memory of something, of a longing for being at the ocean or being with that person or thinking about uh, an emotional aspect of a thought that I was having. Mm -hmm. Or I see a student or somebody uh, during my day and I'm like, that could be an interesting face. Yeah. And I can kind of pull that out as an amalgam of an experience that then it says something to me, but it doesn't necessarily have to read that for the viewer. Mm -hmm. I'm less interested that the viewer has the understanding that I feel generates the work as mm -hmm. opposed to that they get something from it from their own standpoint. My ideas in terms of generation, I think, sometimes approach a personal uh, space. And you know, I'm willing to discuss any, any painting in terms of what I was thinking about, but I'm not sure that's necessary in terms of the work I'm doing now. Sure. Um, I did a, a, a lecture at the El Paso Art Association last weekend, and that discussion came up because I showed like, you know, 30 flowers that I had painted and one mm -hmm. woman said, I hate painting flowers, but you've shown me you could paint flowers in a different way by painting 30 different ideas of a still life. Mm 
Yeah. And so people get, I, can, I think, stuck in it has to look like that flower as opposed to taking charge of pushing that flower, pushing the flower to a place where it becomes something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and that just takes doing many, many, and many of them. Yeah, so absolutely. So I, th I think the lesson is more not putting a feeling on something, but trying to discover something within yourself about what you're doing that is evocative of a feeling. Sure, sure. And so, okay, so before we go today, Frank, I wanna talk about this. A couple years ago, we got together, Border Learning Conference, February 20th, 2020, I remember the date. And uh, it was about the pyramid. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and you and I talked about the pinnacle of the pyramid, and I would love to work with you again and a couple of the other people. Let me tip this table over really quick. <laughs> a couple of the other people from the arts, uh, Ted Carver and, of course, Alexis Anderson, and, and get together and do something that uh, would, would also show off what that pinnacle is. I had a great time with you, but I will tell you something. Frank requires fresh flowers. Well... I mean, he's too good for fake flowers. <laughs> I, don't mind fl I don't mind fake flowers. I just think that if you're wanting to pull the energy of flowerness out of something, you need to work with that. Of the course. Energy. Right. Of course. I loved it. And I did. I went out and I bought fresh flowers for Frank <laughs> and brought them to, to our presentation. And it went very well. It I was well. very, very happy with it. We have to... We have to do that again. It was a good experience. Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit difficult because it becomes drawing or artist performance, which I'm not sure it actually is in terms of fine art, mm -hmm. uh, or at least some of the paths in fine art. Uh, but, I, but I do agree with you. I would say that the most important class you could take at EPCC is a drawing one class. Mm -hmm. And I would say that learning to draw is more important than reading about drawing. So doing it was the, what the pin pinnacle of appearing was about. Reading about playing tennis doesn't help you. You have to go run and play tennis. So yeah. I do think the energy of that, that, um, that exercise was that the action of doing mm -hmm. creates the pushing of that level where you, you have the, we can both do this. Yeah. You could riff on your clarinet, mm -hmm. I can riff on a still life, because we've spent years and years training ourselves of right. what that experience of sitting in the studio and practicing is about. Right. So I think it was an exercise in illustrating the practice of something uh, and it was a great experience. I'd yeah. love to do it again. Absolutely. Frank, thank you so much for finally coming on the show. I appreciate it. It was great. And uh, we need to do this again. So Frank Rimbach, you can find him on Instagram. You can find this fabulous book on Amazon.com and also you can find the man the mystery himself, Frank Gribach at the Rio Grande campus and Via Verde. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Frank. And I will see you all next time. Au revoir.